20 horses in the Derby, 14 horses in the Oaks. The major lifting has been done. The finishing touches put on the three-year-olds as we rapidly approach Friday and Saturday. All that's left, the post position draw presented by Ford for the Longines Kentucky Oaks and the Kentucky Derby presented by Woodford Reserve. Lots of buzz in the air as uh, the connections continue to trickle in to the Aristides Lounge and the Kentucky Oaks draw is just moments away. Joe Christopher and Scott Shapiro joining you and uh, Scott, uh, Kentucky Oaks, star-studded field. Same with the Kentucky Derby. We're doing both draws on one day. Can't wait to get those overnights, those past performances. Next stage of our handicapping begins in a couple of hours. Great to have a little bit of extra time. Great to be here, of course, but for those Kentucky Derby PPs, I think both of these fields came together beautifully over the final preps. Horses that looked like they were the major contenders took big steps forward. Pretty excited to get things going. Let's take a look at the Kentucky Oaks leaderboard board horses earning points on the road to the Longies Kentucky Oaks and we've got undefeated horses on the one two slots Kathleen O coming from South Florida and Echo Zulu the two year old champ from last year she won her three year old debut at the fairgrounds. Of the two of them I think the draw much more important for Echo Zulu getting out of the gate as a speed horse. Kathleen O sure you don't want to draw the inside probably and not the far outside but her goal will be to save ground early under Javier Castellano and make one big run. Secret O dominated Oak Lawn was third most recently, the Arkansas Derby against the boys for Dwayne Lucas, who has won four Kentucky Oaks as we flip the page. Taking a look at Hidden Connection, who just missed uh, in the Fairgrounds Oaks last stop behind Echo Zulu. Yeah, Hidden Connection, another horse I'm very much, uh, have my eye on him where she draws. Drew outside uh, Echo Zulu in the Fairgrounds Oaks, stalk that day. Maybe if she draws inside, we get a more aggressive ride from Ray Gutierrez. A begin on the all side looking in. She is programmed as number 15 as the lone, also eligible. The Kentucky Oaks draw just moments away. Let's send it over to the third member of our team, Brandon Staubel, for a look at uh, how the draw is going to work here this afternoon, Brandon. Thanks, guys. We're going to utilize a, a traditional pill-pull draw, 14 horses uh, in the box, 14 pills in the jug. We'll pull a horse. We'll pull a pill. We'll do that for the first seven, and uh, then we'll take a short break. We'll come back, draw the other seven. This is the same system utilized by Churchill Downs on a regular basis. All right. Thanks, Brandon Scott. Nine furlongs the distance. Decent run into the first turn. We'll find out the post position shortly. Yes, we will. And like I said, the speed horses, not too many of them, but they're the ones that I'm going to keep my eye on. Most horses in this field, I think most post positions will work Travis just fine. Travis Stone will host the proceedings momentarily. First at Steve Buttleman, the bugler for Churchill Downs to get things started. Good afternoon, everyone. Travis Stone from Churchill Downs, and welcome to the draw for both the Oaks and the Derby, taking place on the same time, the same day, Monday of Derby Week. Beautiful day here in Louisville. I'd like to welcome on the stage the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission Chief Steward, Barbara Borden, presiding over her 11th Kentucky Derby. Also on the stage is Churchill Downs Racetrack President Mike Anderson. This will be his 26th Derby he's been involved with at Churchill Downs. Churchill Downs Incorporated General Counsel Neil Curtis, his third Kentucky Derby. On the table, we have Vice President of Racing and Racing Secretary Ben Huffman. He started with Churchill Downs in the fall of 2006. And next to him is Assistant Racing Secretary and Stakes Coordinator Dan Bork. They are responsible for putting all of the races together throughout the season here at Churchill Downs. And of course, to hang the silks is Miss Kentucky, Haley Wheeler. As mentioned, it's a entry sheet and pill pull draw. We'll draw seven horses, take a brief break, draw the next seven. And with that, here we go. One in 14. Right off the bat, also eligible 15 is Beguine with Ricardo Santana. Also eligible 15 is Beguine. Here we go. Number seven. Seven, Echo Zulu, Joel Rosario. 
Number seven, Echo Zulu is trying to become the first Philly champion to win the Oaks and Silver Bowl at day in 1999. She'll be making her Churchill Downs debut in the Oaks, but she's raced at four different racetracks and has never lost. Trainer Steve Asmussen has won the Oaks twice. Joel Rosario seeking his first Kentucky Oaks victory. Echo Zulu, number seven. Number eight. Eight, Venti Valentine, Tyler Gaffleone. Number eight, Venti Valentine is a New York bred by Firing Line, who was runner-up to American Pharoah in the 2015 Kentucky Derby. She's also never been worse than second in her five career starts and narrowly lost to Nest last year, who projects to be one of the favorites this year. New York-based Jorge Abreu will use leading rider Tyler Gaffleone in the Oaks. Venti Valentine, number eight. Thirteen. Thirteen is Shahama, Flavian Pratt. Number 13, Shahama, for trainer Todd Pletcher. She'll be making her North American debut in the Oaks. She hasn't raced since February, but she is undefeated in four starts and has never lost a race by less than two lengths. She is unmistakable on the racetrack. Shahama has a giant white blaze covering her entire face. Shahama, number 13. Number nine. Nine is Desert Dawn, Umberto Raspoli. Number nine is Desert Dawn. The Californian was an upset winner of the Santa Anita Oaks in her most recent start. She is owned and bred by Elena and Hollis Krim of H&E Ranch in Globe, Arizona, making Desert Dawn an Arizona bred. Umberto Rispoli has the mount for Phil D'Amato. Desert Dawn, number nine. Number six. Six, Yugiri Florent Giroux. Number six is Yugiri, whose first career start was a winning one right here at Churchill Downs. Last September for trainer Rudy Brisset. Like her sire Shackelford, Yugiri has plenty of tactical speed, which figures to be an asset in this year's Oaks. Jockey Florent Giroux, who has won the Oaks twice, posted a chart of her maiden win on Twitter to remind everyone of her versatility. Yugiri has indeed won races both on the lead and after rating. Yugiri, number six. Number 10. 10, Kathleen O, Javier Castellano. Number 10 is Kathleen O, one of three undefeated Phillies in this year's Oaks. She has won her four starts by more than 12 combined lengths. Trainer Shug McGehee won the Oaks in 1993 with dispute. Javier Castellano is seeking his first Oaks victory with Kathleen O, number 10. Number four. Four, Nest. I read RTs. Number four is Nest, who hinted at her talent when winning her first career race going long by five lengths last September. She's only lost once, and the margin of her breakout win in the Ashland was the third largest in the last 30 years. Jockey Rad Ortiz, who's been on her for all of her wins, has the call on Nest. That's number four. That's the first seven. We'll take a brief break, and we'll draw the final seven right after this. Echo Zulu drawing post position number seven for the uh, Kentucky Oaks, drawing outside Scott of the other supposed speed in here, Ugiri. So good draw for her. You've got Kathleen O in post position number 10. A good draw for her as well, although maybe not as important as some of the others. I think what's most, mo most noteworthy here is Ugiri being right inside Echo Zulu. Ugiri wired out the field in her most recent win in the fantasy. Florent Giroux was aboard. Almost has to go now with Echo Zulu drawn. It was outside, or it could get a little bit dicey. Let's take a look at the first seven post positions right now, and you see the inside three gates, uh, Scott, are still available. A lot of those middle gates are taken up, including, like we mentioned, uh, Echo Zulu drawing outside of Ugiri. Yeah, and where Hidden Connection, who uh, what will be in the second tier in terms of wagering draws, will be very important. If she draws one, two, three, or five, that really could set up a contentious early pace with both Ugiri and Hidden Connection drawing inside the likely pace setter Echo Zulu. Seven down, seven to go, and don't forget to begin with the also eligible is going to be number 15. We've got seven left in the Kentucky Oaks draw. Let's send it over to Brandon Staubel for his thoughts uh, on what we've seen so far. 
Yeah, just like you guys said, the fact the uh, the speed horses, uh, six, seven, and eight, Venus Valentine, uh, Echo Zulu, and uh, Ugiri, uh, they're the speed's going to be in the middle of the race and probably going to go ahead and I think this pace is going to be a little more contested than we originally thought. Nest looks like a winner uh, so far, going to be able to save ground and kind of watch things develop up front. Kind of disappointed with the post for Shahama. I like the way she's coming into the race, but uh, she's going to be have it kind of tough out there. Probably going to have to drop back and uh, maybe uh, near the back of the pack, guys. Shahama's had a little bit of difficulty breaking from the starting gate. She's got an outside post, but a stalking style for the most part. We'll see what happens into that first turn. You mentioned Hidden Connection. Obviously, Ness drawed pretty well in four. The other one outside Hidden Connection that uh, we're looking for and waiting for is Secret Oath. I think Ness may be the biggest winner here of the uh, first seven to draw. She'll be able to sit kind of a perfect pocket trip under Irad Ortiz Jr., which is right to her speed, you know, off of the early pace setters. Already like they're coming into the race like her even more now. Yeah, decent run into that first turn, going a mile and an eighth. Uh, we have seven post positions yet to draw. Let's send it back over to Travis Stone uh, to continue the proceedings. All right, here we go. We'll draw the final seven for the Kentucky Oaks. The mile and eighth distance here at Churchill Downs gives the horses about, about a furlong and a half run to that first turn to establish position for the race. And gentlemen, the final seven. Okay, here we go. Number five. Five, Goddess of Fire, Johnny Velasquez. Number five, Goddess of Fire, is Red Oak Stable's homebred, is one of Todd Pletcher's three runners in this year's Oaks. Pletcher with four wins in the Oaks is tied for second all time. John Velasquez and Pletcher won last year's Oaks, and they won their first Oaks together back in 2004. They're teaming up again with Goddess of Fire, number five. 14. 14. Turner Loose, Manny Franco. Number 14, Turner Loose, the outside post for this year's Oaks. Started her career with four consecutive turf starts, but won her dirt debut at the fairgrounds in her first start as a three-year-old. Manny Franco, who regularly rides in New York, has the call. Brad Cox won the Oaks in 2018 with Monomoy Girl and 2020 with She Dares the Devil. 14, Turner Loose. Number two. Two, Nostalgic, Jose Ortiz. Number two is Nostalgic, a dolphin homebred who was given a perfect ride by Jose Ortiz in winning the Gazelle last time out at Aqueduct. Ortiz won the 2019 Kentucky Oaks with another good ride on Serengeti Empress. Trainer Bill Ma is the third all-time leading trainer here at Churchill Downs, seeking his first Oaks win. Nostalgic, number two. Number 11. 11, Cocktail Moments, Corey Lannery. Number 11 is Cocktail Moments. Corey Lannery is going to ride one of a few fillies that broke their maiden here at Churchill Downs. She's never been worse than third in four career starts, despite developing a distinct come-from-behind style. Corey Lannery is the fourth leading all-time rider here at Churchill Downs and is always worth a little extra. That is Cocktail Moments, number 11. Number one. One secret oath, Luis Saez. Number one, Secret Oath, trainer Dwayne Lucas is back in the Oaks and is one win away from tying Woody Stevens for most wins. His first win came in 1982, his most recent, 1990. Secret Oath broke her maiden on our Stars of Tomorrow card last year, became a major Oaks contender after winning two stakes at Oaklawn Park by a combined 14-plus lengths. Luis Saez will ride Secret Oath for the first time. Post one. Number 12. 12, Candy Raid, Rafael Bejarano. Number 12 is Candy Raid, the most experienced horse in the race, was a last to first winner of the Bourbonette Oaks up by 71 last month at Turfway Park. Her running style is similar to that of Blind Luck, who won the Oaks in 2010. Blind Luck was ridden by Rafael Bejarano, who will also ride Candy Raid. Number 12. And the three. Three is Hidden Connection, Relu Gutierrez. Number three, Hidden Connection, kicked off this year's Road to the Kentucky Oaks by winning the Pocahontas last year right here at Churchill Downs. Her rider, Ray Gutierrez, graduated from SUNY Cortland in New York with a degree in exercise science, and he told me he looked at his student loans and decided to pursue a career as a jockey. Gutierrez said trainer Brett Calhoun has Hidden Connection back in her best form, evidenced by nearly beating Echo Zulu last time out. Hidden Connection number three, those were the 14 that have drawn. We will now take another brief break, get you the morning line odds. We'll be back after this.
the results of the draw getting a little bit more intriguing with those second seven horses, including Hidden Connection, who's got some speed with Ray Gutierrez aboard. Good forward rider drawing post position number three, and then Secret Oath uh, drawing the rail here, Scott. Talked about Hidden Connection being key, as well as Yugiri, where they drew in relation to Echo Zulu. Both of them drawing inside. It looked like this would not be a very fast-paced Kentucky Oaks. I still don't expect it to be extremely fast, but those two drawing inside forces their hands a bit. And you mentioned Secret Oath, a very interesting horse to draw the rail. Full field of 14 uh, for the Longines Kentucky Oaks are coming up on Friday. And again, uh, the 15 will be Beguine. That is an also eligible. Here are the 14 in the body of the race. Secret Oath from the rail. Hidden connection from post three. Yugiri, Echo Zulu. And again, the gate break is probably key. If you asked any one of these trainers, they would probably tell you, we're going to play the break. We want to be forward. Where that takes us into the first turn obviously remains to be seen. Yeah, the key and why I mentioned the speed horse is drawing inside is if you want to kind of stalk from the outside it's a lot easier you kind of have more options coming out of the gate when you're a tactical speed type horse and you're drawn towards the inside the options are much more limited take a look at the 14 for the Longines Kentucky Oaks coming up on Friday uh, let's get Brandon Staubel's thoughts on uh, the post position draw which is now complete Brandon yeah, I mentioned earlier the fact the speed six, seven, and eight uh, hidden connection draw on the inside to me also kind of makes this pace maybe a little more contested. Uh, from what we've seen in the mornings, this one's uh, been very aggressive, uh, a little bit headstrong at times. So I think they uh, don't really want to get caught in behind horses. I would expect them to want to send and get good position out of there. Um, just I think the biggest takeaway, guys, is I think the pace is going to be a little quicker in my eyes than what we first expected. Well, thanks, Brandon. And uh, Scott, Echo Zulu's undefeated. She has never been headed, right? And uh, she finally faced a battle last time out in her three-year-old debut. There was a question whether or not she would make the Fairgrounds Oaks. Almost got caught by Hidden Connection late. And then Kathleen O, a come-from-behind sort, nest a little bit of a stalker, secret oath from the rail. Let's take a look back at the Fairgrounds Oaks now. And Echo Zulu is on the lead here. Hidden Connection set a little bit further off the pace that day than maybe we thought, and she almost uh, came and got her in the final This strides. was her first start off the bench. Steve Asmussen talked about her not being fully cranked, and she was tested, like you said that's hidden connection on the outside under Ray Gutierrez who opted to sit a few lengths off the pace that day when he thought maybe he was going to take it to Echo Zulu it almost worked but it was Echo Zulu once again barely hitting the wire first in a tight one to make it five for five this will be hidden connections third race uh, back off of the layoff and her third start as a three-year-old one would think that echo zulu could improve you know the pedigree maybe a little bit sprinty for her a uh, nine for long distance a little bit of a question mark but it is for all of these fillies it is she's gonna have to improve she just didn't run fast enough to beat the likes of kathleen o and nest at least if they run their last race but the expectation is she definitely will take a step forward how big a one she does that's the Question. Fascinating race tactically with Kathleen O and Secret Oath likely coming from off the pace. Yes, yeah, Secret Oath's trip's going to be very interesting. Luis Saez takes the call for the first time. The more aggressive rider than Luis Contreras who rode in the past. She's been caught along the inside in tricky spots before and overcome it when she was much better than Fields in Arkansas. But here, that trip's not going to work, so it'll be interesting. If she could sit a perfect pocket trip, which I expect her and Ness to do if all things go right, they're the major players in here. You know what else is going to be interesting? The morning line odds here, because favoritism could go to to any one of uh, maybe even four horses, the big four, like we like to call them, packed room in the Aristides Lounge with the Kentucky Oaks draw now complete, the Derby draw on the horizon. Let's find out what those morning line odds are as we send it back to Travis. Thank you, gentlemen, and welcome back to the post position draw for the Kentucky Oaks. Kentucky Derby soon to follow. Now we have the Twinspires.com morning line odds as prepared by Mike Battaglia. And for those of you in the room, I'll read the odds down in alphabetical order since we all have these draw sheets. I will identify the first three favorites though as we do so. So first off on your draw sheet, number 12, Candy Raid, is 30 to one. Number 11, Cocktail Moments with Corey Lannery, 30 to one. Number nine, Desert Dawn with Umberto Rispoli, 20 to one. Number seven, Echo Zulu with Joel Rosario, third choice at four to one. Number five, Goddess of Fire, John Velasquez, 15 to one. Number three, Hidden Connection with Ray Gutierrez, 20 to one. Number 10, Kathleen O with Javier Castellano is the second favorite on the morning line odds at seven to two odds. Number four, Nest with Irad Ortiz Jr. is the five to two 
morning line favorite for this year's Kentucky Oaks. Number two, Nostalgic with Jose Ortiz is 15 to one. Number one, Secret Oath, Luis Saez, six to one. Number 13, Shahama, Flavian Pratt at 15 to one. Number 14, Turner Loose with Mandy Franco, 20 to one. Number eight, Venti Valentine with Tyler Gaffleone, 20 to one. Number six, Yugiri, Florent Giroux at 30. And also eligible 15, Begin is 30 to one. So once again, the morning line favorite for the Oaks this year, Nest at five to two, followed by Kathleen O, seven to two, Echo Zulu, four to one. We'll take another brief break, get ready to draw the Kentucky Derby, and we'll be back after this. We've got undefeated Phillies in here and high profile Phillies in Kathleen O and Echo Zulu, but the five to two morning line favorite off that huge victory, Scott, in the Ashland at Keeneland is Nest. Uh, you surprised at all? Well, it was an unenviable position for uh, odds maker Mike Battaglia. Very hard to separate the top three or top four, depending on how you look at it. I'm a little surprised he made anyone five to two. I thought the morning line favorite would probably be three to one. I thought it might be Kathleen O, but again, we're very tough spot with all three or four if you count Secret Oath being very close together. Yeah, definitely splitting hairs and the pair of mutual money is going to speak uh, as we get into the eventual wagering. Let's take a look at the uh, post positions now in their totality with the morning line odds for the 148th running of the Long Jeans Kentucky Oaks. Grade one mile and an eighth coming up on Friday here at Churchill Downs and uh, again five to two morning line favorite is Ness drawing post position number four. You've got the second choice uh, that is the undefeated um, Echo Zulu is four to one. She's the third choice. Seven to two on Kathleen O is the second choice. And then Secret Oath at six to one, third against the boys last out. She's going to take some money, uh, not only because of her form, but because of her trainer. Well, what's interesting is I think a month before now, Secret Oath might have been considered the favorite, but then Nest, or Echo Zulu as well, but then Nest, and of course Kathleen O with big steps forward in their last preps made them the favorite and the second choice. Both will be coming from off the pace. Echo Zulu, four to one. I expect her to take some money for sure. We'll be interested to see if Secret Oath does indeed go off that much further than the uh, top three in Nest, Echo Zulu, and Kathleen O. Trainer Todd Pletcher with three horses in this year's Kentucky Oaks. Headlined by the morning line favorite Nest. Uh, he stands by with uh, Brandon Staubel. Brandon? Thanks, guys. Uh, Todd, go through three of them pretty quickly here with uh, Nest. You have to be happy with that inside draw. Probably going to save some ground and let some others do some work up front. Yeah, very pleased with the draw for her and got us a fire four and five. Very good. And uh, Shahama was one I was kind of interested in, especially the way she's training in the mornings. Maybe didn't get the best of it in the 13 hole. Um, what's your thoughts on that? You know, she's a filly that watching her, her videos of her races in Dubai, she doesn't jump real well. She's not real quick away from the gate. I actually think she might be better off out there. We'll give Flavian some options in terms of being able to drop in. I think if she was stuck inside and didn't get away well, it could compromise her a little more. Let's switch gears to the Derby. Uh, maybe Mo Donegal, Pioneer, Medina. Talk about those two, uh, especially maybe Mo Donegal. Are you looking for any particular draw, or you just kind of know with his style, I mean, really uh, anything's going to be okay? Yeah, I think anything's going to be okay. I think, you know, even with the new gate, people don't want to draw the one, but he was able to win from the rail and the wood memorial. So, you know, I'm not going to worry too much about, about him and Pioneer Medina's draw. I'd love to see Charge it hit somewhere in the middle. Yeah, speaking of Charge it, he's turned some heads in the morning. Beautiful looking Colt. Uh, just uh, probably mid pack, using some positional speed to get that position and then just kind of see how it shakes loose. I think he's got better tactical speed than the Florida Derby showed. You know, he didn't get away well there. He hit the side of the gate and got some kickback for the first time. I, th I think, you know, in his first two races, he showed a little more foot. So if he can get away cleanly, I think he'll be in the first tier. Todd, you got a lot of action this week. Uh, are you enjoying things so far, though, in Louisville? You've been here for a little bit. Yeah, things are going well. Um, you know, I'm really pleased with the way the horses are trained. The breezes went smoothly. So now uh, just hope everything continues to go that way for the next week. Well, good luck, Todd. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Guys? All right, thanks to Todd and thanks to Brandon. And uh, he mentioned Mo Donegal, who was extremely impressive in the Wood Memorial, a horse that uh, had some ups and downs this winter, really put it all together in New York, and uh, had to work to get there, Scott. But a 111 late Brisnet speed rating gives the uh, closer fans uh, lots of hope. Early voting for Chad Brown was loose on the lead set. Honest fractions, not fast ones, but it was Mo Donegal saving ground throughout under jockey Joel Rosario, angling out at the top of the lane and showing that the nine furlongs of the Wood Memorial was not an issue. Definitely seems to prefer the distances as they get longer. 
Yeah, Todd mentioning the fact he doesn't really care all that much what the post position uh, winds up being from O'Donnell and out the back closer. It looks to me, Scott, that there will be at least an honest pace in this year's Kentucky Derby should aid a horse like Modonigal, but again, in a 20-horse field, have to get a little bit of racing luck. Without a doubt, especially when you're coming from off the pace, it'll be Irad Ortiz Jr., not Joel Rosario this time around. And I think there's some important draws that'll happen with the Kentucky Derby, but unlike the Oaks, I don't think it's going to dictate whether the pace is contentious. It's just certain horses I think would rather be outside instead of inside. Brad Cox has uh, three horses in this year's Kentucky Derby. He has a Philly and Turner loose in the Oaks as well, and he stands by with uh, Brandon Stobble. Joined here with trainer Brad Cox. Uh, Brad, let's go to Turner Loose uh, quickly. Uh, drew the outside 14 hole. She does have some positional speed. How do you kind of see it uh, maybe playing from the break? Probably break running. Uh, Monomoy girl broke from out there, so I'm okay with it. But, uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, you know, hopefully she can break say, a little bit of ground going into the first turn. That last uh, workout for her, you talked about maybe changing some equipment. She looked a lot more relaxed. Yeah, much better uh, this week as opposed to the week before. Way too keyed up and uh, aggressive going to the pole. And, uh, didn't finish up the way, way we were looking, uh, what we were looking for, and uh, much better this week. So she's definitely coming into the race a little bit better. Moving on to the Derby, uh, let's talk about Zozos. The three of us here on set, we've kind of been raving about this horse. We think he's going to run a lot better than maybe what people think. Uh, talk about maybe what you feel like his talent level is right now. We run a big number last time. I think if he can move forward off that, he's had time, six weeks between Louisiana Derby and the Kentucky Derby. So if he can move forward again, I think he's definitely a player. Um, you know, he should be able to put himself in position early and we'll see, what it, see how it goes. And uh, Cyberknife, uh, he's been pretty good in the mornings, which I think is kind of the MO sometimes on race day. He's been known to kind of act up a little bit. Um, are you worried at all about, I know there were 60,000 plus at Oakland, going to be a lot more here at Churchill. Is that something you, you worry about or one of those things you just can't control? No, I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, we actually schooled him today and he was very good. So uh, he's handled himself very, very well since coming here from Oakland. Uh, he was here last fall. He's run here a few times, so he has some experience here. And uh, so far, so good. I think he's in a good good spot mentally and physically right now. Florent uh, in the Arkansas Derby seemed like he kind of made a little bit of an early move, but I think he felt like he didn't want to get stuck behind traffic. Um, so knowing that he's got some positional speed, do you kind of think maybe mid-pack for Saberknife? Yeah, maybe, yeah, mid-pack maybe a little bit, for, you know, in front of that. I, I We'll see how it plays out. I, I do think he... You know, rode him very confidently in the Arkansas Derby. It worked out, and hopefully, uh, once again, he's another one that's going to need to take a step forward, and he's getting five weeks. We'll see how it goes. We wish you the best of luck, Brad. Enjoy the week, okay? Thanks, Brandon. Back to you guys. Thanks to Brad, always for his time, and uh, Brandon as well. Brad uh, Cox finishing first and third in last year's Kentucky Derby. He's got three shots uh, this year as well, including Tawny Port. As we take a look at the Kentucky Derby points leaderboard, the road to the Kentucky Derby, Scott, lasted seven months. It began here with the Iroquois at Churchill Downs, and when the dust settled, Epicenter, who rolled through the preps in New Orleans, is our points leader. Yet 164 points for Epicenter, the likely favorite in the Kentucky Derby. He did very little wrong in Louisiana. Just beat in the LeCompte. Three wins in the other prep races. Zandon, the impressive win in the Bluegrass. All the way down to Taba. Just two lifetime races. That win in the San Anita Derby earned him 100 points. Final preps were spectacular for all the winners and a lot of the runner-ups and third-place finishers. As well as we flip the page, a classic causeway back in could add to the early pace. Messi expected to be a pace factor as well. And Zozos keeps getting better. He's lightly raced, but the Brad Cox has him where he needs to be. Yep, and Smile Happy, the Kentucky Jockey Club winner up there on the second page. And we move to the third page here. Pioneer of Medina and Ethereal Road getting into the field. They were on the also eligible list a short time ago. D. Wayne Lucas back in the Derby the first time since Bravazo. All right, the Kentucky Derby draw is now just moments away. We have 20 horses and two on the AE list. Travis Stone once again handling the proceedings. But first, back to Steve Bottleman.
Steve Butterman with a quick change from the pink to the red, signifying we're about to draw the Kentucky Derby, the 148th running. Once again, welcome back to Churchill Downs. It's Monday of Derby Week, beautiful day outside. The energy in the room is real as we get set to draw the 148th Kentucky Derby taking place this Saturday. I'll let Ben announce the also eligibles with two also eligibles in here. We'll draw 10 horses and then we'll take another brief break and we'll draw the final 10 for this year's Derby. Ben? Okay, the two also eligibles in order of points. Also eligible 21, Rich Strike, Sonny Leone. Also eligible 22, Rattle and Roll, James Graham. They will have until Friday at 9 a.m. to draw into the race. Friday at 9 a.m. is scratch time for both the Oaks and the Derby. Okay, here we go. Number seven. Seven, Crown Pride, Christophe Lemaire. Number seven is Crown Pride. This is trainer Kohichi Shintani's first international graded stakes winner, and they sound pretty excited here in the front row. Shintani has piqued a lot of interest this week with his unique to America training style for the UAE Derby winner. He is the second Japanese bred to run in the Kentucky Derby. Master Fencer, who was the first, ran sixth. Crown Pride, number seven. Number 13. 13, Simplification, Jose Ortiz. Number 13, Simplification is the Fountain of Youth winner, was third as the favorite in the Florida Derby. Jockey Jose Ortiz said they'll need another start like the Florida Derby to get position, but that the Fountain of Youth was probably his best style. He said in the Florida Derby there was mid-race pressure he believes caused their late fade. Ortiz has finished second and third in the Derby from only six mounts. That is Simplification number 13. Number 20. 20, Ethereal Road, Louis Contreras. Number 20 is Ethereal Road, who jumped into the derby scene just this morning, narrowly lost the Rebel this year. This will be Dwayne Lucas's 50th Kentucky Derby starter. He is seeking his fifth win, number 20, Ethereal Road. Number eight. Eight, charge it, Louis Saez. Number eight is Charge at a Homebred from Andy Pope's Whisper Hill Farm, who made his first start in just January of this year. In the Florida Derby, he broke inward and hit the gate door to his left-hand side. Despite that, he still finished second. And the Florida Derby is historically the most productive prep for the Kentucky Derby. 24 winners coming out of the South Florida race. That is Charge It, number eight. Number five. Five, Smile Happy, Corey Lannery. Number five is Smile Happy, who powered home in last fall's Kentucky Jockey Club right here at Churchill Downs, defeating several other derby rivals in the process. Lucky Seven Stable is owned by Louisville's Mike Mackin and his family. He said they will have at least 70 and upwards of 80 family members in attendance this weekend. He was disappointed with the second place finish in the bluegrass until a reporter said to him on the racetrack, how does it feel to have a horse qualify for the derby? To which he said, the disappointment instantly went away. That is Smile Happy, number five. Sixteen. Sixteen, Cyberknife, Florent Giroux. Number 16, Cyberknife. Trainer Al Gold started owning horses back in 2004. Cyberknife is his first graded stakes winner. It's been well reported these last few weeks that he named Cyberknife after a device used to treat prostate cancer. He said he wanted to get the story out on how painless and successful the method is. He's done just that. We wish him luck on both fronts. Cyberknife, number 16. Number two. Two, Happy Jack, Rafael Bayrano. Number two is Happy Jack. Trainer Doug O'Neill said this week that training horses is a, quote, inexact science. And he worked Happy Jack the atypical distance of one mile at Keeneland on Saturday. O'Neill said Happy Jack is a really good-looking, healthy colt that thrives on action. And to prove it to himself, he wanted a really solid piece of exercise. And Happy Jack responded beautifully. O'Neill is seeking his third win with the Calumet Farm homebred in the Derby. Happy Jack. Number 18. 18, Tawny Port, Ricardo Santana. 18, Tawny Port shares the name with a type of Portuguese wine, looks to join Charismatic and Swale as Derby winners to prep in the Lexington. 
Trainer Brad Cox credited John Ford of Petrie Stable for wanting to try the Lexington. It was his first dirt victory. This will be Petrie Stable's fourth derby starter. They finished second with Invisible Ink back in 2001. Tawny Port, 18. Number nine. Nine, tis the bomb, Brian Hernandez, Jr. 30 years ago, Lily T used what is now known as the Jeff Ruby Stakes on the road to his Kentucky Derby win, and Tis the Bomb is hoping to do the same, just as Animal Kingdom did back in 2011. The obvious question surrounding Tis the Bomb is whether or not the surface is the reason for his improved form is late, but Brian Hernandez credits maturity more than surface, saying, since he has turned three, he has grown up a lot. Tis the Bomb, number nine. Number one. One, Mo Donegal, Irad Ortiz. Number one, Mo Donegal. Jerry Crawford of Donegal Racing said they use an algorithm to find classic distance horses, and so far they've finished third twice in the Kentucky Derby from just three starters. He calls Mo Donegal a freight train horse that is flexible with post position, which is good as he just drew the rail, and they're thrilled to have Irad Ortiz riding. Speaking of Irad, when asked if it's Irad or Irad, he said, quote, however you feel comfortable, followed by a laughing emoji, so I read it is. O'Donagall, number one. And that is uh, the first 10, so we'll take a brief break and we'll be back with the second 10 right after this. Todd Pletcher said that uh, he wanted a middle gate for Charge It. He got it with post position number eight. Maybe the most interesting fact about the first 10 being drawn and the second 10 to come, a lot of the speed horses don't have a gate yet, Scott. They do not, and that's uh, kind of what is most noteworthy after 10 horses, Joe. But Mo Donegal drawing the rail. Nobody really wants the rail, but of all the horses, especially the top contenders, I think he's the one that matters the least. I think Cyberknife drawing the 16 is a very positive. I think Brad Cox would likely agree with that, getting him towards the outside. Then he has some options. I know he doesn't want to be on the lead, but I don't think he wants to get too much dirt kicked in his face and maybe be in a stalking position. Yeah, there's several horses that have speed as we take a look at what we've seen so far from the draw and then there's a lot of stalking types and then an equal amount of closers too you just don't want to get hung wide in that first turn if you can avoid it sometimes the traffic into the first turn is unavo uh, unavoidable more likely traffic uh, down on the inside uh, Scott but Modonigal's a deep closer so is Happy Jack Smile Happy probably mid pack to a late closer in this race as well well Smile Happy's pilot Corey Lannery known for wanting to get to that rail and save ground you had to expect he was going to want to do that anyway in the bluegrass he was caught wide and was caught by Zandon in the lane now he's closer to the rail like he likes to be and will look to save ground tis the bomb a horse that draws the nine hole I think that's a fine post I expect Brian Hernandez Jr. to try to get him out of the gate a little better and get position but not a whole lot of uh intrigue or things that I would be that concerned with with this draw horses like Tawny Port and Ethereal Road will just have to try to save ground from off the pace Classic Causeway, Summer is Tomorrow, Messier, Zozos, even Epicenter. Some of the horses we expect to be forward do not have post positions as of yet as we send it over to Brandon Staubel for his early thoughts. A 10 down, 10 to go, Brandon. Yeah, I think that's the biggest takeaway from me, guys. Uh, the fact we still have all the speed to be drawn. Uh, some closers drew the outside. Obviously, Mo Donegal on the inside, so we kind of know what they're going to do. I thought the, the big winner here was Crown Pride, uh, the seven hole. You heard the connections uh, celebrate. I think they should. Uh, it's a great post to be able to kind of set up shop. Also, Cyber Knife, too. You guys talked about kind of that open air trip on the outside. I think that's going to be a great trip for this horse. All right, thanks, Brandon. Uh, still 10 horses to draw in Kentucky Derby 148. We mentioned a lot of the speed horses, uh, of course, Epicenter, Zandon, the 1 2 finishers in the point standings coming into the Derby. Zandon hasn't drawn a post uh, yet either. Uh, some outside posts, some inside posts left on the board. Lots of intrigue for our second 10. Well, other than the rail and the five hole, lots of inside posts left and lots of speed horses. I think that's one of the things I was going to take away most from the draw. Which speed horses drew towards the inside and were going to have their hands forced and which drew towards the outside and have those options that I spoke of a little while ago. So we'll see. Epicenter you mentioned, Zozo's, Zandon. Stand on. We will see what happens soon. The connections of 10 of the horses know their post. Additional intrigue for the rest of the connections as we send it back to Travis for the remainder of the draw. All right, here we go to draw the final 10 post positions for Saturday's 148th Kentucky Derby. Gentlemen, last 10. All right, here we go. Number four. 
four, Summer is Tomorrow, Mikhail Barcelona. Number four, Summer is Tomorrow, was born in America, sold in England, conditioned in the UAE by an Indian trainer, and will be piloted by a French jockey, a true international entrant in this year's derby. His trainer, Bupat Simar, assisted by his wife, Caroline, is in his first year as head trainer. He has worked in the United States before. Summer is Tomorrow has early speed and is expected to show it early. Number four. Number 10. 10, Zandon, Flavian Pratt. Number 10, Zandon. Owner Jeff Drown named Zandon after a Colorado hunting buddy who will join him here in Louisville. When asked how he was feeling, he said, life's a journey, can't to get too upset over a horse race. And then he paused and said, but it sure would be nice. This will be Chad Brown, seventh Kentucky Derby starter. He His best finish was with Good Magic, second at nine to one. Zandon figures to be at least half that price come post time. Flavian Pratt, who moved his tech east earlier this year, is seeking his second Derby win. Zandon, number 10. 19. 19. Zozos, Manny Franco. Number 19, Zozos, is named after a restaurant in the Virgin Islands where Minnesotans Barry and Joni Butzo were eating. There the day Zozos won his first race for trainer Brad Cox. Manny Franco, who finished second with Tiz DeLaw back in 2020, has the mount. It'll be his first time on Zozos to prepare. Manny said he's going to watch film of his past races to familiarize with himself as much as possible and then lean on Brad Cox for any additional insight for number 19, Zozos. Number 15. 15, White Abario, Tyler Gaffleon. Number 15, White Abario, trainer Safi Joseph Jr. will be experiencing a May Derby for the first time this year. And is trying to stay calm, but admitted the nerves will kick in come race day. When saddling a horse, he likes his jockeys to be assertive coming out of the gate. But after that, it's up to them. And he will leave it up to Tyler Gaffleon, who started riding regularly here in Kentucky in 2018 and has won six straight Churchill Downs riding titles. White Abario, 15. Number 14. 14 is Barber Road, Ray Gutierrez. Number 14, Barber Road has been never worth, worse than fourth in eight career starts, despite developing a deep closing running style. Ray Gutierrez will go through his normal routine after today's draw, and he says, like when preparing for a test, he doesn't want to overdo it, but his goal will be to drop in and save as much ground as possible. Barber Road is trainer John Ortiz's first derby starter, post 14. Number 12. 12, Taba, Mike Smith. Number 12, Taba. Taba is the nickname for the city of Medina in Saudi Arabia, much like calling New York City Gotham or Los Angeles the City of Angels. In the last 10 years, three horses that won the Santa Anita Derby went on to win the Kentucky Derby. Mike Smith, a two-time Kentucky Derby winner, has more bounce than anyone and is at 56 years old, looking to become the oldest winning jockey on Taba. Number 12. Number 11. 11, Pioneer of Medina, Joe Bravo. Number 11, Pioneer of Medina, drew into the main body of this year's Derby just yesterday. It'll be a seventh career start at his fifth different racetrack, and he's never had the same jockey twice. He's from Pioneer of the Nile's last crop at stud, who is also known as a sire of American Pharaoh. Pioneer of Medina, number 11. 17. 17, Classic Causeway, Julian Le Peru. Classic Causeway is the first horse in the main body of the field to appear on the road to the Kentucky Derby leaderboard back in October. After a disappointing start in the Florida Derby, Brian Lynch briefly removed him from consideration, but they're back in. And jockey Julian Leperu, who's ranked fifth in all-time wins here at Churchill Downs, said their final workout went perfectly, but was non-committal about strategy, wanting to see how today's post-draw went. Classic Causeway, number 17. Number three. Three, Epicenter, Joel Rosario. Number three, Epicenter. An earthquake around the naming deadline prompted Ron Winchell and racing manager DJ Fisk to settle on the name Epicenter. For Churchill Downs all-time leading trainer Steve Asmussen, this will be his shortest price derby starter yet. He has twice finished second. Jockey Joel Rosario won the derby with Orb in 2013. And the six. Six is Messier, John Velazquez. 
Messier will be the 13th Canadian bred to start in the Kentucky Derby. Victory Gallup finished second 1998, the best finisher of that group. He's named after 25-year NHL veteran Mark Messier. Messier will be piloted by 23-year Derby veteran John Velasquez, who is a three-time winner of the race. Another win would put him in a tie for second alongside Bill Shoemaker for most ever. And that is Messier. Number six. So those are the post positions for Saturday's 148th Kentucky Derby. We'll take a brief break. We'll be back with the morning line odds for this year's run for the Roses. Back after this. Epicenter drawing post position number three and Zandon drawing post position number 10. Uh, those uh, draws stood out a little bit for the two horses that many believe will vie for favoritism uh, when the horses do leave the starting gate on Saturday. Not a lot of losers in this draw, Joe. I think everybody, for the most part, will come away happy. Epicenter drawing inside all of the other speeds is noteworthy, especially Summer is tomorrow, assuming he gets out of the gate right to his outside. But if Epicenter comes away running and the other horses that we expect to show speed do as well, he could get a very similar trip against the larger field like he did in the Louisiana Derby. Yeah, he's got that natural speed. There's a long run into the first turn. Again, you don't know who's going to break left who's going to break right coming out of the starting gate. You never know who's going to get compromised, but with a clean break and his natural speed should put himself in good position. As we take a look at the uh, entire board now with the 20 post positions, and we'll get the morning line odds in just a few moments. Uh, Scott, tactically, what do you see from some of the speed horses? Messier and six summer is tomorrow drawn to the inside of him. Yeah, you would think Messier would be able to sit just off the pace. If it breaks on top, maybe go on with it. Taba drawing towards the outside. I'd have to think they're connected. We're happy with that. Didn't want to draw along the inside. Has had favorable outside stalking voyages, especially in the San Anita Derby. White Abario, a horse that I think would like options. Tyler Gaffleone aboard, but usually gets out of the gate and finds good position. Classic Causeway from that far outside. You'd have to think Julian Le Peru will be aggressive. Generally a, a relaxed, passive type of rider, but with this horse, I would expect him, the way he gets out of the gate, to get into things early. And then Zozo's to the far outside. I know Brad Cox has talked about him getting into the race earlier, but again, this will give Jockey Manny for Franco, plenty of options. Yeah, Manny's got to be a little bit aggressive sure. coming out of there. He doesn't want to get hung wide on that first turn. There is a long run into the first turn, but that would even be my first thought. That needs to get it just a little bit aggressive to make sure he gets decent position. He certainly has the speed to put him where he wants to be in and out of that first turn, and obviously the backstretch and sorting yourself out, and who's going to make the first move between the early speed horses and the stalkers, and then the closer sitting at the back just hoping for a fast pace to run at late. Yeah, and Zan that we didn't talk about or I didn't bring up in the 10 hole, I think that's just fine for him. Probably drawn all the way down to the inside or the far outside would have been the least favorable, but not the kind of horse Assuming he gets out of the gate better than he has where I think post positions matter too much. All right, let's send it over to Brandon for his thoughts. The 20 horses in the Kentucky Derby. The field is set. The post positions are drawn. All that's left is the morning line. What are you thinking, Brandon? Yeah, I think uh, for the most part, all the connections really have to be pleased. I mean, uh, nobody really got that bad of a post. Uh, even Mo Donegal from the inside with his style, the one hole, uh, just I think can just kind of sit there and, and save ground all the way around. You talked about Zozos. They're going to be aggressive from the outside. I mean, there's pretty much one way to go there. Classic Causeway, the same thing. Scott mentioned Zandon. I mean, I think that's a great post for him. If he breaks well, he can just kind of sit there mid-pack. And uh, I think overall, guys, the biggest takeaway for me was I think everybody has to be pretty happy with their posts. Everybody's going to speculate, and thanks, Brandon Scott, as to how this is going to play out going in and out of that first turn. But Rock Your World was supposed to be on or near the lead last <laughs> year, and uh, that didn't work out so well. So there's a lot of racing luck involved when those gates do finally spring. Yeah, when you look back and watch those Kentucky Derbies, a lot of chaos happens right out of the gate. So it's hard to know exactly how it's going to go. But I think we have a good feel for the five or six horses that want to be prominently placed. There's a good chance that at least one of them won't come out running. But I think, like you said earlier on, could be a contentious early pace regardless of where these horses drew. A lot of the trainers we've talked to that have tactical speed with their horses want to be on or near the lead when the horses hit the track kitchen. Yep, that's the key. You don't want to be too far out of it, but that long first run into that uh, first turn gives you plenty of chance to make your move. All right, so the 20 post positions have been drawn to also eligibles as well. Next up, the morning line, which Mike Battaglia will give us through Travis Stone. Let's find out who the favorite's going to be right now. All right, everybody, welcome back to the post position draw for the Oaks and the Derby. We just drew the Derby, and now we have the 
Morning line odds as prepared for by Mike Battaglia. Battaglia has made the morning line for the Kentucky Derby for 48 years. So here we go. And we'll do the same thing as the Oaks. And we'll read down those odds in alphabetical order for the Kentucky Derby. All right, here we go. Number 14, Barber Road is 30 to 1. Number 8, Charge It is 20 to 1. Number 17, Classic Causeway is 30 to 1. Number 7, Crown Pride is 20 to 1. Number 16, Cyberknife is 20 to 1. Number 3, Epicenter is 7 to 2, the second favorite on the morning line. Number 20, Ethereal Road is 30 to 1. Number 2, Happy Jack is 30 to 1. Number 6, Messier is the third favorite at 8 to 1. Modonigal, number 1, 10 to 1. Pioneer of Medina, number 11, 30 to 1. Number 13, Simplification is 20 to 1. Number 5, Smile Happy is 20 to 1. Number four, summer is tomorrow, 30 to one. Number 12, Taba, 12 to one. 18, Taniport, 30 to one. Tis the Bomb, 30 to one. White Abario, number 15, 10 to one. Morning line favorite for the 148th Kentucky Derby, number 10, Zandon, three to one. Number 19, Zozos, 20 to one, and both Rich Strike and Rattle and Roll, the also eligibles 21 and 22, are 30 to 1. So there you have it, the fields for both the Oaks and the Derby. We'll see you here, Churchill Downs, all throughout Derby Week and, of course, Friday and Saturday. We'll send it back to the guys on set. Thanks for joining us today, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Well, thanks, Travis. Uh, the draw for the Kentucky Derby has been complete. Your morning line favorite at three to one is Zandon. Epicenter close second choice, Scott. At seven to two, you could have probably flipped a coin between the two of them. The big question is which horse is Mattress Mac in the bet? That is going to be key. That big money that's going to come in from Mac will play out and probably determine who the favorite's going to be. I'm a little surprised that he did go with Zandon in the end. I think both horses with plenty of buzz. We've been calling Epicenter the probable morning line favorite for weeks now. We were wrong. Lots of buzz in the morning on Zandon, though, and a lot of people over the course of the last few days, myself included, thought that maybe he would be the post-time favorite. Morning line, a little bit of a different story, but Mike obviously agrees. Yeah, and I'm not surprised at all with the separation that Mike Battaglia put between the top two horses and the rest of the field. In a 20-horse field with a lot of serious contenders out of the top two, you kind of had to do that. A little bit surprised that Taba's 12-1. to All right, let's send it back over to Brandon, standing by with Steve Asmussen. Steve, thanks for joining us. Uh, let's go to the Oaks real quick. Uh, Echo Zulu, um, kind of in the middle of a couple other pace players in there. How do you kind of see the trip uh, playing out? Well, hopefully she's away from there sharply, drawn 7 of 14. I think it's a very good draw for her going a mile in an 8. Um, she's been training really well. Expect her to be easy to find in the race. She's got uh, plenty of uh, what I call brilliant speed, but she's very rateable, very, relaxes beautifully. Um, that has to be a huge asset going this distance, right? Well, it, she has to, to this point. She's broke very cleanly and been very comfortable on the front end. And switching over to the Derby, I um, was looking up some stats. So Gunrunner broke from the five hole, Curlin from the two. This doesn't probably bother you very much, does it? Well, you just same thing. You want a nice clean break. You know, Epicenter's uh, got plenty of race and he's got a lot of season in the inning. Just uh, how long it takes him to load. You want to wait, get away from there, There's be some anxious moments in that. Just want him to stand up good in the gates, get away from there cleanly, and expect him to run his race. He's another one too, just so relaxed in the mornings. Is that something you've kind of seen from him from day one since you got him in the barn? A lot of confidence. I think that he, he's, since with victories and with success, he's uh, been very proud of himself and goes about like he can handle what he's doing. We appreciate your time, Steve. Thank you and good luck. All right, thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Steve. And again, Epicenter, he's got that cruising speed. He's got Joel Rosario. I don't care if it's a $5,000 claiming race or the Kentucky Derby as we take a look at the 20 horses and their morning line odds, Scott. The 
time when everybody's holding their breath as the horse is loading in the starting gate and the horse is breaking from the starting gate. Because once they hit that first turn in the back stretch, you got a much better idea of what your chances might be. The major difference is the 20 horses loading into the gate instead of anywhere between 5 and 14 or so. But other than that, you're right. But I think Steve Asmussen, of course, the Hall of Famer, nailed it. The key for Epicenter will be getting out of the gate. If he gets out of the gate like he has in his other starts, that inside post really will not matter. Summers tomorrow is a big key to this race. We saw him on the lead in the UAE Derby. He was a sprinter earlier in his career. He went fast in the UAE Derby. He held second, and uh, Messier drawn to his outside. You know he's going to be forward. You would think so. I think the goal for some uh, for Messier would be to sit just off of Summer is tomorrow. We know Johnny V uh, has won derbies before, and he's going to do so by being aggressive. Now, the question is with Messier, when does he make that move, and who else is up there with Summer is tomorrow in Classic Causeway? But when you look at this, again, I know Brandon and I said it, you agreed. Not a lot of losers when it came to this draw. Even the horses that draw, drew inside are horses that it really doesn't matter that much for. Pioneer Medina has speed from post 11. Zozo's from post number 19. But your morning line favorite drew perfectly. Uh, Zandon didn't really matter all that much where he drew, but I'm sure that uh, Chad and his team, Chad Brown, uh, not disappointed one bit. I would say if you could have given him the 10 post, pet post when he came here, he would have signed up and been on his way just an insignificant post. Maybe the inside, the far outside would have been things he wouldn't have cared for, especially with the inability to get out of the gates over his last two starts, but like you said, a perfect post. Brandon Staubel standing by with a gentleman who knows a thing or two about winning the Kentucky Derby. Brandon? Doug, yes. they uh, just mentioned you know a thing or two about winning the Kentucky Derby, so glad you could join us. Uh, post two, just kind of give us your overall thoughts. Well, you know, uh, in all honesty, we are hoping to be a little bit more on the outside, but uh, as soon as we got number two, we were like, hey, we like number two. So, uh, But they got the, it's the first year of a, a new gate, and there's more room now from uh, the inner horses to the rails. So uh, I think that's a little advantage. And uh, we got uh, Epicenter is right outside of us, who's a big-time speed horse and talented horse. So, uh, But I think having Rafael Beirano in a saddle is huge. He's so experienced. He knows his track better than anybody. And Happy Jack's training really, really well. So we're optimistic. Speaking of the training, a one-mile workout at Keeneland, um, you've done that with some other horses before. Just kind of talk to us about the workout. You know, I just wanted to come in, uh, win, lose, or draw, just be as fit as we could possibly be. So I uh, wanted to have Rafael get on him and work him, which we did. And, and uh, it was just great to see Rafi uh, get along so well with him. Rafi was so happy with him. They galloped out. I got him galloping out a mile and a quarter in 207. So, I mean, it was a really strong work. And... Keeneland's uh, got a good cushion to it, so they, they really get a good blow on the track over there. So we're just hoping we're bringing in a fit horse who's hopefully uh, his numbers are uh, on the rise and will shock the world. Doug, we appreciate the time. Enjoy uh, the next week, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Back to you guys. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Doug and Scott. 20 horses. A couple of years ago, we had two gates, and now we have one gate. Uh, I think it's uh, good for everybody involved and uh, looking forward to the third for the third year uh, to use the, the new starting gate uh, with 20 horses. Yeah, much better deal for everyone involved, especially, though, that horse that was in the one hole. Lots of differences between the new gate and the two gates that we used to use and to kind of describe why the one hole maybe isn't as bad as uh, many people think. Let's throw it back to Brandon. Yeah, Doug O'Neill kind of helped us uh, with a little segue to this uh, segment here. The, the starting gate uh, before when we had the auxiliary gate, uh, 15 through 16, but the biggest thing was the rail. Nobody ever wanted to draw the one hole because basically you were going to run straight into the rail. You kind of had to make a right turn. If you didn't break well or maybe you broke well but somebody else comes over, you just were in a bad place in there. So the one actually kind of basically started from the rail and then you had to come over. So now with the new starting gate, 65 feet long, but that gives everybody plenty of room. You can see how many paths, two or three paths extra that these horses are going to get to be able to find position. Makes things uh, a lot fairer, a lot safer, and gives everybody a fighting chance. Well, thanks, Brandon. Uh, I mean, if I'm the connections to Mo Donegal with an off-the-pace horse who's already proven that he can come through a tight opening on the inside, and I look at that video, it makes me feel a lot better. I think it's a good pose for yeah. him. I mean, 
you know, things could go wrong a lot easier when you don't get out of the gate and things of that nature. But he's a horse that likes to save ground. He likes to come with a late run. And you never know, maybe the rail will open up and it'll be a dream run like it was for him in the Wood Memorial. He earned it in the Wood Memorial. He'll have to earn it in the Kentucky Derby. But if he can save ground throughout, it'll work towards advantage. You mentioned this earlier, 20 horses in the race. That's like six or seven want to be forward. Six or seven want to stalk the pace. Six or seven want to come from off the pace. So it's fascinating in so many different ways, Scott. And you never know what's going to happen until the gates open. But a mile and a quarter test, 150,000 people. you got to have the physical ability. You've got to have the mental ability. And you've got to have the ability to show the stamina it takes to win the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, absolutely. There's some, there are some inexperienced horses in this race that are going to have to take that mental step forward, get out of the gates, deal with the crowd. You spoke to it there. It's not just about being fast. It's about being mentally tough. The Kentucky Oaks field has been drawn. The Kentucky Derby field has been drawn. Scott, post positions uh, are complete. And uh, we're just waiting for the past performances now with the entire card for both Friday and Saturday. We'll be able to dive into the Kentucky Derby card earlier than ever. Really excited about that. Plenty of other great racing before the Kentucky Derby. The Oak Stakes races were already drawn. Going to be a lot of fun, Joe. Kentucky Derby week is now officially upon us. Champions Day coming up on Tuesday. We race Tuesday through Saturday, Kentucky Derby Day. The Kentucky Oaks, of course, on Friday. Thanks for joining us for the Draw Show. And have a great Derby week, everybody.